So I'm going to talk to you about creating meaningful entertainment and what do I mean by that. But first, uh, please let me shortly introduce myself. Now, my name is Tomasz Kisilewicz. I came to you from Warsaw in Poland, where I'm currently a lead artist at 11-Bit Studios. And for the topic of my presentation today, actually more important than who am I is who are we as 11-bit, as a company, like what lies deeply in our DNA. Now, to understand that, we'd have to look at that motto that the heads of our studio established very early on when thinking about what kind of games we want to create. So we want our players to feel that their gameplay experience, choices and decisions they make in our games, they really matters, that it all has a sort of a meaning. Now, we grew as an indie, and even though we grew up much in size, we still feel a part of the indie movement. But we're saying now that we would like to be an alternative to AAA titles by delivering AAA quality with a certain twist on the gameplay and the narrative devices which we're using. Now, we are saying we want to think different, and while I know that it's a really worn up slogan today, uh, but we also address our games to those who want something else from their everyday entertainment. But the thing is being innovative in such a fast-paced and demanding and competitive industry as ours uh, is really hard. You always say you have to think out of the box, but with games, thinking out of the box in many cases means thinking about the box, designing it, creating it, getting out of it, thinking and repeating that process over and over and over again until hopefully one day something clicks and you can get the experience you were looking for from the very beginning. Now that basically summarizes our process of working on a game. But enough for that, now let's take a look at some examples from our history. In 2011, uh, just a year after the studio was founded, we released Anomaly Wars on Earth. Now, in the middle of indie apocalypse, this small title from Poland was able to gain a wide audience and selling very well on all major platforms. Among hundreds of generic tower defense titles, there was one that decided to go an opposite direction. We had put a literal twist on the tower defense genre by switching the rules for something new, the tower offense game. Now, that led us to a fresh and creative gameplay, but it also helped a lot in the marketing process of the game. But then we would have to move our clocks three years ahead. It's 2014, and 11-bit is releasing a new game, This War of Mine. The game was a great success, sold almost 5 million copies up to date. How many of you did play This War of Mine? Perfect. So at the very mechanical core, it was just a survival game. Some early prototype here, you know, a shelter, you had some crafting mechanics, scavenging mechanics. The uniqueness of title came with the idea for the setting and a thematical wave of the game. Now, it was supposed to be a war game told from a civilian perspective. That picture taken from the first teaser of the game uh, actually explains very well what was the main message of our game. Now, on the left side of this picture, you have your regular action. I mean, soldiers shooting on the streets. We've been there, we've done that in our action games, FPS, RTS games. But we wanted to look at the right side of the picture to see what's going on behind the closed doors on your you know, regular Call of Duty map. We wanted to have a conversation about the drama that takes place right next to your regular action. There's this term in the movie industry, you probably all know that, uh, called elevator pitch. It means that your idea is good if you're able to pitch it to another person during a single elevator ride. Now, a war game told from a civilian perspective, <clears throat> you're able to pitch it going from first to the second floor. But I think for game development, there's another term called grandmother pitch. I think it applies even better. It means that if you can enable your idea in few simple sentences to grandma, to grandpa, or any other person that's not necessarily related anyway with games. If you're able to do it, then your idea is clear and good enough. So I actually pitched this war of mine to my grandma. She, one day she was asking me, oh, what are you doing with those video games? What do you do for a living? And I told her, you know, I'm working on this war game, but you're not trying to fight anyone, you're not trying to shoot anyone. You're basically gathering food, some medicine, and try to live by to the end of the world. Now, 
she was stunned. She could not comprehend that video games, something she connected in her head with pure fun, crazy entertainment, could touch those areas. And you have to keep in mind we're talking about a person that still very vividly remembers the horrors of the World War II in Poland. And she asked me, like, can you even do that? And we could and we did, but her reaction even until this day, I'm oh, sorry, her reaction even until this day reminds me how much of a burden we had as developers while working on this title. But another couple of years later, uh, April last year, releasing our biggest title up to date, the biggest budget, biggest amount of people working on it. It's a society survival with some city building elements. Yet again, heavy in difficult choices and moral dilemmas. That game was Frostpunk, a game that had turned back the four-year development cost, including marketing, in just 66 hours, being number one top seller on Steam for a couple of weeks. Now, I had showed you three brand new titles with original stories and settings, three new and successful IPs in a day and age where everything that's not a sequel or a reboot or an adaptation is being considered, and rightfully so, a high risk. So apart from those being our games, and apart from me bragging about them, so what do those three titles have in common? Well, these were all some creative and unique ideas, followed by strong and distinct visuals. You see, for us, the key is to define and properly execute your message. Now, let's take a deeper look into this War of Mine example. We knew what kind of a story we want to tell, what kind of an experience and thematical wave want to deliver, but it was extremely important to find and balance a proper tone that would serve those purposes very well. As we were touching a very delicate matter. Now, war is something still extremely vivid and relevant to a wide part of our audience. Story and the setting in this War of Mine were strongly influenced by uh, war in the Balkan area, the Sarajevo siege, uh, Kosovo, Chechenia, etc. So it was our burden as developers to talk about war in a respectful but yet impactful way. We had to find those proper tools in both the gameplay and the visuals. You see, when touching those delicate matters, we're balancing on a very thin line. Now, on one hand, you don't want to get too subtle, as your message might you know, get lost in translation. But on the other hand, you can't go too far, you can't go too hardcore, you know, because you might be getting to this very vulgar or even cartoonish uh, territory. And in the end, you would be undermining this meaningful experience you are working on. For example, with this slide, a few months ago, I was given a speech in Copenhagen, and there was a very nice event about ethics in video games. Some great speakers, mostly academics, with you know, a very in-depth look at, at uh, morals in video games, etc. And I had a similar slide, but the difference was I used a different picture for the right side of the graph. Uh, there was something very explicit as zoom in on some bodies. And, Immediately, the slide appeared on the screen. I realized I've made a terrible mistake. Like, I saw on the faces of those people that I've crossed the line. So at first, I thought I had undermined everything I was talking about, and I actually have that up. But in the end, I feel this anecdote shows, again, how, how much of a burden we had as developers. You see, this misery of those people touched by war, that's not something you would like to exploit. But who are those people I'm talking about? Who are those civilians touched by a war that we wanted to talk about? Well, they are everyday men and women, just like us, me and you in the audience, just regular people facing a war that's coming to their doorsteps. That's why we decided to literally put ourselves into the game. As you can see, we used our pictures, the photos of the staff, our coworkers, friends, people from our circles. That's actually me chatting with my girlfriend in an abandoned bar somewhere. Because you see, we didn't only use photos, we literally put ourselves into the game using 3D scans. We used the first generation Kinect to scan everyone and actually have our 3D models in the game. Now here, another important thing we had to remember. This could not look staged. We didn't use any makeup. We were dressed in our everyday clothes and all those things 
had put a controlled level of realness into the game. Now, in our art department, we use the term of layers. That's how we construct the games. So that was a layer of realness for us. The story was supported by real photographs taken around the office. And again, we didn't want this to be staged too much. And we didn't want to go you know, to hardcore, to vulgar. It had to be proper in tone. Even the framing was very important. I mean, that's one of my favorite examples. Sure, we could be showing just the guy hanging on a rope, but putting it this way, we knew we were delivering the message in a very effective, direct way without, without exploiting the deaf imagery. And putting ourselves into the game has created yet another danger. I mean, these are all our friends. Some of the staff kits were scanned for the game. You don't want to see your own children, your kids, being killed in the video game. So that leads us to our second layer. We called it a layer of novelty. We had to create a style that would help us distance from those horrors of the story told throughout the, uh, throughout the game. And we looked at many inspirations in music videos, film, etc. Here's a cut from an AHA music video with the pencil sketch style. We were also influenced by street art and Banksy and graffiti in general, mostly because these are the devices that help bringing strong messages in a very clear, direct way. But also due to some striking, iconic pictures from Bosnia that actually influenced us in creating the world of Pogodan. And all of that, all those devices, created a final image of the game. Right now you can see the pencil sketch style with graffitis. A certain mood and tone had to be set. It brings on feel of a drawn story, feel of a novel. Because as an art department, we had to help designers in anchoring players into the worlds we were all creating, to make our players think about war drama in general. We wanted players to face dilemmas, but what kind of dilemmas really? Some kind of big, world-changing decision-making? What kind of choices do they have to face? Well, unless you're watching an action movie, civilians at war usually don't change the course of the history. They face everyday problems. So those dilemmas had to be real and believable as we were touching the personal dramas of everyday people, some small personal decisions. People asking for a shelter. Now, do we have enough resources to allow that? Or stepping by one of my favorites, You're stepping by an elderly couple with a pastry full of food while you and your group of people is starving to death. Now, what are you going to do? You see, there's this great anecdote. When the game was released, one French journalist uh, was really amazed by the world we created. And in his, re uh, in his review, he, he uh, described the situation at this very location in supermarket. When you come here, there is a group of scavengers looking for, uh, for stuff and materials just like you. And once you enter the location, they tell you, well, it's safe here. There's enough stuff for all of us. So you can you know, walk around, look for stuff. And the thing with this journalist was that once he was trying to leave the location, this group killed him. And he was amazed. Like, usually in video games, when NPC tells you it's safe here, it's really safe here, but you can't trust anyone here. The funny thing is that was never designed this way. It was a bug, actually. Because this group of scavengers, at the end of the night, they were leaving uh, the level. And once the first from the group left the level, uh, there was a bug in AI that registered this event as him being killed by a player, so they immediately turned against the player and killed him. But I would say that the world was so coherent, the message was so clear here, that even some bugs like this one could be interpreted as features. So while working on this war of mine, we always have to look back at the main message we want to convey. Make sure that we stay true to that message, and the tools we're using to present them are properly selected. But in the meantime, we finished that game called Frostpunk, and that was a whole new animal to handle. Now, a question to you again. Uh, how many of you have maybe played Frostpunk? A few hands, okay, good. So question to you and answer it uh, in your head. What is Frostpunk? What is this game? Now, I already told you it's a society survival city builder. 
Now, it is a catchy phrase, it can get your attention, but it still doesn't really describe what kind of game are we talking about. Is it more like City Skylines, or is it more like uh, Banished? We need more information about the setting, so let's dive deeper. Now, Frostpunk is a society survival city builder based in an alternative reality of 19th century England. So, we got the historical era, and we can imagine some stuff. It's a city builder, 19th century, maybe Victorian architecture, etc. But for those of you who did play the game, you know that we need more information. So let's do it one more time. And now Frostpunk is a society survival city builder based in an alternative reality of 19th century England where you are the leader of the last city on a frozen earth during a steampunky snow apocalypse. Now the steampunk kicks in. You've got the frozen apocalypse. You are the leader. That's, we have a much bigger picture in our head. But with this new creative setting, there's a new challenge rising. We needed a strong and clear visual code to communicate those gameplay ideas to the players. So that Frostpunk cover didn't have to look like this, but more like this. And actually, all of those important elements are here apparent on this picture. You've got frozen world with icy walls, the steampunky generator in the middle. You as a leader and your citizens, an angry mob surrounding you, ready to overthrow you at any given moment. But getting to that image was a long way. Because before Frostpunk got its frozen shapes, first prototypes were created under the name Industrial. Now, it was an idea for a steampunk city builder with sociotech elements of some sort. And we wanted once again to ask important questions, to give moral dilemmas to the players. We wanted to see what a society is capable to do when pushed to the limits. And in order to do so, we needed to take our game to way harsher circumstances. So that's where the frost came up. Whole life in the world might disappear in this frozen apocalypse. Your city might really be the last city on Earth. Your citizens might be last people on Earth. Now, whole species are at stake. We're amplifying the dilemmas. We're amplifying the message by the setting. And then a concept of the whole appeared. At first, a strictly artistic concept. Among our concept artists, this very iconic central alignment started to emerge. It became clear to all of us that it is a direction that we should be heading. Because that whole gave us some priceless boundaries making our city a more intimate place, but also amplifying this feeling of alienation, this claustrophobic feeling. I mean, this hall is your home, your shelter, just like in this war of mine. But also that hall may as well become your grave. This hall became an important world-building element for us and a narrative device. It reshaped the game on yet another level. With a circular hall and a central generator, it became clear to us that we have to create a circular placement system for buildings and streets. And it was not an easy process, required hard work and many iterations from all departments, but we ended up with a fresh and unique gameplay experience. All of that had allowed us to transform those early industrial prototypes into this, the final image of the city. But that is only one layer of Frostpunk. This is where all the economic and city-building stuff happens. What makes Frostpunk so special lies deeper. It is the heart and soul of the game. By that, I mean the people, the society, citizens of the last city on Earth. People that you're supposed to guide through the storm as a player. But how to represent them in a title like this, and most importantly, how to represent and communicate their needs visually. First of all, obviously, we have to know how our people should look like. We looked through many references from 19th century, but we wanted to create something unique, add some steam technology, winter clothing, etc. We needed some unifying elements. That's how very early in concepting phase, the team came up with this unique Frostpunk lantern. We needed those elements that would unify our people, no matter the gender, age, or class from regular workers to engineers, from kids to the elderly. And in-game, at the city level, you can see every single person walking around the buildings. You can actually click on every single citizen, and game shows you their portrait, name, occupation, and basic information. And that's great stuff, but it didn't address all of our needs. Still, it was about a single person. It's not enough to describe the society. 
to show people as a society, to show their collective emotions, we needed to invent special channels of communication to show their needs, demands, and the consequences of our ruling. Now, the first channel is a special pop-up window we call CTA, which means call to action. Those messages pop up during our game to mark some important events and require your reaction as a leader. But we didn't want to make those pop-ups UI heavy. No, we didn't want windows filled with text. Many strategic games fall into that. But we we're not creating a strategic game. We wanted to show emotions. So for that, we needed some key visuals. And we started with animations and looked great, fantastic. However, we faced a big problem here. Now, that approach was extremely heavy in production terms. And we needed to show big groups of people their collective emotions. So we scaled down our approach to some 2D parallax motion. And it turned out that this solution was great. We got ourselves some flexibility regarding iterations. Now, Keep in mind, there were over 600 of those events, and some of them were being iterated by designers even a few days before the review build. Here you can see this kind of 2D uh, motion we ended up with. As you see there, we're able to show larger groups of people. What's more important, we can show their faces, their emotions, and here people are coming angry about thefts happening in the city. You have to decide what you're going to do with it. And it comes with consequences. Because we are also showing the progression of those emotions. The first level is still quite calm. They come to you with a problem. Now, what happens next depends on your decisions. The second level of anger is when they protest and they demand changes. Now, you can see we're using the same people, the same faces, just to present how they change their attitude toward you, toward you as a leader. And the third level is when they riot, and this is actually the last time they come to you. Now, what I told you so far was about reacting to some events, showing the players some indicators of their wrong or well doings. But as a ruler of the city, you also have to think ahead. You need to plan, build strategies. Now, that leads us to our final layer, the channel of communication. This is something we call Book of Laws. In Book of Laws, you can sign rules and laws that will shape your society, that will affect the life of your people. Now, decisions you make here are irreversible, and some are tough. Best example is one of the first laws that you have to sign, the child labor. By putting illustrations in Book of Laws, we want to show you how your city will be affected by your decision. In this case, we have to show children going to work. Because at this very moment, you're deciding if children are going to work in coal mines, for example. Sure, from an economical point of view, it might make perfect sense. We will have more hands on board. But what about the people? We needed to picture that image in front of a player. And I would argue that it could not be done with just a text. We didn't want our players to treat people in Frostbank as yet another resource, as yet another number or a statistic. Now, take a look at how much of the space on the screen is taken by the text describing the law and how much for the picture of an actual person that's going to be affected by it. By those images, we're showing what can happen to our people. Should we sign up law for hospitals? Now, don't think about people characters in your game as a bunch of zeros and ones. When you're signing a law for amputation, we want you to look in the eyes of a person that's going to be affected by your rule before you make your final call. And now for a brief summary. Uh, for us, the message is the key. Not art, not design, not code, not any other department or element per se. Emotions and gameplay have to come first. You have to know what you want to say. You have to know why you want to say it. And then find a way how you want to say it. And from my perspective of a lead artist, now the game message must be converted to the visual language of the game. Art must always be true to the game meaning, and art must always amplify this message. Now, thank you very much. That will be all from me.